Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me to talk. And uh, hopefully, this will be sort of a nice example of using a, uh, a large database to try and answer a, a, a clinical question that came up. I know people are probably tired of hearing about uh, COVID, but even if you're not interested in the specific question, maybe it, it's some information on that. Um, and like Aaron said, I did um, s some years ago have a uh, pilot uh, project that uh, helped us from Excel. And this project also uh, benefited from some of the resources in the, the uh, Beard course. So that's uh, uh, maybe another reason to present this here. See if I can make the slide go forward. So our, our clinical question that sort of inspired us to look at this was we were trying to figure out the timing of when people in the ICU should be intubated when they had respiratory failure from COVID-19. And this is something that sort of has varied widely in the pandemic. Um, initially, people were worried about uh, disease transmission and were saying we should intubate them early. And then people kind of moved and started saying stuff about, you know, we should avoid intubating them at all costs because they do badly when they're intubated. And there, there's been a lot of controversy on that. One of the measures we can use for sort of severity of respiratory illness that might be a trigger uh, to intubate someone is something that's called the ROX index, which is just the oxygen saturation divided by the fraction of inspired oxygen. So if you're on 100% oxygen, it would be 1.0, divided by the respiratory rate. So the higher the number, the better you're doing, the lower the number, the worse you're doing. And this was initially proposed for patients on high flow nasal cannula with bacteria pneumonia. And they found that a ROX greater than 4.88 predicted success with high flow nasal cannula and not needing intubation. They were less good at sort of predicting what failure was gonna be. And this is sort of a very intuitive thing because it's basically saying if you're on a lot of oxygen and you're breathing really fast and you're not saturating good, that's bad. Whereas if you're on less oxygen, saturating better and breathing more comfortably, that's good. So to, to look at this, we used um, the uh, Cerner real world data. So this is a database put together by the Cerner Corporation that makes an electronic uh, medical record uh, called PowerChart um, for us anyway. And it involves uh, data from 62 institutions. Um, they had a specific COVID uh, data set. So it was just COVID patients. It has to be accessed on the uh, Cerner servers. So you can't download any of the data. You can work with it in various programming languages. I think the most common one being Python. Um, and the, all the data is de-identified and it's also date shifted. Um, so you can't tell the exact date that the patients were treated. So using this, um, we looked for codes, we made sure the patients, you know, qualified with a diagnosis of COVID, that their encounter started after January 1st, 2021. And we looked for patients that were intubated during their hospitalization, but not intubated in the emergency department. We used ICD-10 codes to identify the intubated patients. So we ended up with 2,102 patients with that. But then some patients didn't have either the fraction of inspired oxygen or a way to calculate that or were missing some other part of what's needed to calculate the ROCS index. So we excluded 412 patients. Then we ended up looking and saying, oh, some of them, the ROCS was more than four hours before intubation, so maybe that's not so relevant. So we excluded a few more patients and we ended up with an analysis set of 1,087 patients. And these patients were mostly male, 62% male, 36% of them were uh, white, so it was kind of diverse racially. It had a median age of 64 years, uh, a median body mass index of 30. Um, a lot of them had diabetes, more than half. A lot of them had hypertension, almost three quarters and heart disease or peripheral vascular disease was pretty common in more than half the patients as well. The mortality was pretty high. So these were all, these were the subset of kind of the sickest patients. These were people who were intubated and, you know, 55% of them died and another almost 2% were discharged to hospice and presumably, you know, died after that. Um, only a small number, about 8% were discharged directly home. Um, more than a quarter, 27% went to another facility, and this would be something like a rehab or nursing home. Um, and then about 8% had another discharge disposition. When we, we created sort of using multivariable uh, 
linguistic regression, we made a model for the impact of the ROCK score on mortality, taking into account, you know, age, race, the, some of the comorbidities that are listed there, and also the time from admission to intubation. And, and in that model, we found that the higher the ROCK score at intubation, the lower the chance of mortality. So for each increase in one of the ROCK score, uh, so that's breathing slower, having a higher SAT um, at the time that you were intubated, you had a 8% better chance of um, surviving the hospitalization. Um, the longer from admission to intubation was also was associated with mortality. Um, and then some of the other things that you'd expect um, that have been talked about before, like diabetes, were also, um, at least in, from the odds ratio, the direction was um, an association with mortality, although it wasn't uh, statistically significant. So with this, we kind of concluded that um, intubation at a lower severity of respiratory illness, as measured by the ROCKS index, was associated with lower mortality. My take on that is that this idea of sort of avoiding intubation at all costs, um, which is very different than what we do in bacterial pneumonia or flu pneumonia, is probably not a good idea. And that, that maybe this is suggesting we should kind of treat them the same as we would patients with other causes of respiratory failure. Um, and I think the finding that the longer between admission to needing intubation um, was associated with worse outcome kind of supports this as, as well. Um, so again, I really appreciate all the people who helped me, not only with this project, but with all, pro all the projects I, I've worked on. Um, this project really couldn't have been done um, without the help of Mitch, who works at iReach, um, or he actually recently retired from working at iReach, but he had the computer and uh, data analytic expertise to create the data set, the fancy computer language, Python, and also to, it, it takes, it took a lot of back and forth. It's, it's a bigger feat than you might think in terms of him pulling out stuff and us looking and saying, okay, these people were intubated. Let's take a look and see if they actually had ventilator settings and let's try and figure out if, if we're getting a garbage in, garbage out, or if we're getting something that's actually usable. Um, and Rick Kaplan, who was our statistical expert, and Claudine, who helped a lot with uh, methods and has helped me with lots of projects. And then my, my colleagues in the ICU, Andy, Dom, and uh, Mithil. Um, so anyway, uh, I know that was a short, uh, but I understand the goal was to be short, and I'm happy to talk about um, anything else or any questions that I can answer.